Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Welcome back to the show, and welcome to part two of our chat with Bob Ryerson, formerly of the 417th Bomb Group out in the Pacific, where he flew A-20 Havocs. And there's a lot to get into in this episode. We start off by going with Bob on his journey out to the Pacific, talk about flying the A-20 in combat, and then we put Bob into the Pima Air and Space Museum's fabulously restored Douglas A-20 Havoc. So we've got a lot to cover. And as always, I cannot thank the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum enough for their support and continued sponsorship of the Damcasters. They have got some fantastic stuff coming up across the summer. We spoke last time about the Build a Drone program. They have their Night Wings event coming up as well. And also the Pilot Exploration Summer Camp, where your kids can learn what it takes to become a pilot. That's coming up in June as well. So be sure to head over to www.pimaair.org to find out all the latest and register for those things. Of course, if you've had to wait a week for this, you could have become a damn Kistier and got it early. So stick around after the show for all the details on that. If you're new here, please be sure to like, subscribe, put some stars into your podcast app of choice. Do all that great stuff because it really does help the show. And I've been going on for a bit. Let's not hang around and find out what happened when Bob headed out to the Pacific. We went out of there and landed at Johnston Island. Well, Johnston Island is out in the middle of the Pacific halfway between the Hawaiian Islands and New Guinea. And it's a small island, uh, and they don't even have fresh water there. So we landed there and thought we were, you know, go, go find a PX and walk around a little. And they said, no, you're not going any place. All we're doing is getting gas, and there isn't anything here anyway. <laughs> and, so that's what they did. They got gas and we went on to New Guinea to NADZAB, N-A-D-Z-A-B, which was a combat replacement and training center. It was a holding point for to have replacement crews, so in a combat group, gave them word we, we'd like to, we want three new crews up here, or, or however many they wanted. Uh, it, it ended up that the seven crews continued to be ordered up on the same orders to report to the 417th bomb group. So this... So you've stayed together all the way from Savannah straight out through to New Guinea. And, and to the Philippines. Yeah. And to the yeah. Philippines. We did do a couple uh, so-called combat flights there. Mm -hmm. It would usually be an instructor and in one plane and then two other planes with students or replacement pilots. Mm -hmm. And we'd go on, uh, on a flight and go up and strafe and drop bombs on what was called WEWAC, W-E-W-A-K. Mm -hmm which had been a very big Japanese base, a lot of planes, uh, but it had been, uh, it had been bypassed mm -hmm. by the, the force, Allied forces in the Pacific. And uh, they'd, they'd been able to cut off their supplies, so those people just were out there starving and, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully running out of ammunition. And it, this WEWAC, it turns out that it's at WEWAC that this A-20 we'll see later today mm -hmm. was on an attack on WEWAC about four months before I flew over WEWAC had been shot down. Okay. And that plane, they'd gotten a, a little ways from WeeWAC, and then they landed in a in a freshwater marsh, and the pilot and gunner 
were recovered and the, re mm. the plane was recovered by the Australians 30 years later and it ends up over here at the Tema Air and <laughs> Space Museum and you know, the Australians had done some work on it in the museum here in their rehabilitation had fixed that up and we'll see it on display out there. They've done a very nice job with it, haven't they? Yes, yeah. they sure have. And, uh, but there was an A-20 knocked down over WeWAC about five weeks after I'd flown over it. Mm -hmm. So they still had some ammunition. NADZAB was at Combat Replacement and Training Center. I'll tell you, talk a little more on that. Okay. You're not getting too much footage. This is fantastic. You keep going. <laughs> um, I I was on two training. I was on two training flights. Okay. To Weewak, which mm -hmm. was a little bit of navigation, but they're checking our formation flying and. And then we do some strafing there and drop some bombs. Um, on the second flight, second mission there, after we finished there and were ready to go back to NADZAB, the instructor told me, he says, he told me to stay with him and he told the others on the radio to go return to NADZAB. Mm -hmm. He said, we're going to go over into New Guinea. Well, he'd been assigned this. Mm -hmm. So we went over, flew west mm -hmm. into, into New Guinea okay. a ways. And uh, he located what he was looking for. There had been a report of a B-25 on the ground had to made the emergency landing and we were supposed to go over there and check on it. So we went over and flying five feet off the ground, we would circle this B-25 and see if anybody shows up. And nobody did, no, no sign of life. They shouldn't have been hurt in landing because mm -hmm. the landing wheels up. Mm -hmm. But we could see where the, you know, the vegetation had been mm -hmm. knocked down. So they shouldn't have been hurt in landing, but you know, they're, they weren't there. Yep. And they didn't, we didn't carry much supplies. We carried some supplies. We could last a, two, three days. Mm -hmm. But you got that kunai grass over in New Guinea and you got it in the Philippines, a lot of that area. And it grows up, it grows up 10, 12 feet high. Okay. But there's, the, the leaves are almost like a saw. They've got mm. all these things on the leaf, on the edge of the leaf, and they just pull and scratch. Mm. So the, you can visualize some people trying to hike and get someplace, and they're, unless they could run into some New Guinea people that were friendly enough to yeah. to feed them, you know. They got, how are you going to walk 150 miles through that kunai grass? You're yeah. just not going to make it. Oh, that, oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot, there was a lot of that. In yes. The, you know, it's so different from what you think of is in the U.S. Mm. or in Europe. But uh, New Guinea was a primitive country then. Mm. There was very little population, and uh, what there was would be very apprehensive of anybody showing up, mm -hmm. except there'd been some development on the coast. Yep. But when you get away from the coast, it's uh, it's medieval country, mm. and then they uh, assigned those 
seven, the same seven crews to the 417th bomb group. Mm -hmm. And uh, our orders didn't read any date of reporting. And they, and it said WTA. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to ask what's so WTA? Well, it's whatever transportation available. <laughs> And so that's what really was in those, you think that armed services, everything's going to be organized. No. They couldn't do that in those, those early times. Mm -hmm. And so you, we, I would go down, there were two, no, there was, um, we, I guess we fairly easily got a flight to Leyte. Mm -hmm. Well, this is in November of 44. The uh, Allies had gone into Leyte on the west side of Leyte in September of 44. Mm -hmm. And they were still fighting over there. On the east side where the air base was, <clears throat> they'd had a tough time getting airfields because it was rainy and muddy and yep. and so they used uh, this Marsden matting is what we called it mm -hmm. then. Uh, you people more recently called it PSP, mm -hmm. pierced steel planking. Mm -hmm. Sort of six, six feet long by about three feet wide, weren't they? Yep, yeah. yep. yep. maybe not even mm -hmm. three feet mm -hmm. wide and then they hook together. Yep. So it was an emergency runway, mm -hmm. but anyway, we got up there. Well, it was wet and muddy, and so they put us in the transient camp, and so that's what we could do. You could find a mess hall someplace, and <laughs> uh, went one the went one place and couldn't get any transportation. They, they knew where the 417th bomb group was. It, they, we didn't know where it was, but of course they knew where it was. They'd only gone into, that was on Mindoro in the Philippine Islands, and they'd only gone in there a couple of weeks before that. So I went down the other airfield, and uh, yeah, they'd be down here at 3 a.m., and we, we got a flight going up there. So that's what I did. There's several other pilots had gone on and they didn't have room on the planes for their gunners, so I really ended up with, I think, eight other gunners. I think I had 10 gunners and myself and mm -hmm. had to find an airplane that would take 11 of us up there. <laughs> But we did and got up to the 417th bomb group in Mindoro in the Philippines, about 175 miles south of Manila. Okay. So the experience up there, everybody was living in tents. Mm -hmm. I think six people to a tent. And uh, food was pretty good there. Now, when we were back at Nadzab, why, there was limited food, plenty of it, but it was mostly Australian beef, mm -hmm. corned beef, and canned fruit salad. <laughs> now, those were fine with me, but I'd see guys go down to the mess hall in Nadzab and not Take again. a bite and have a <laughs> cup of coffee and go back, give up. But I ate well. But anyway, when we got up in the Philippines, it was better food. And uh, they checked us out there, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, they were more careful on checking us out there. And uh, I suppose we went on a practice mission someplace that. Uh, We started pretty quick, just run on the regular rotation. 
Well, if we were not flying a lot, we'd fly every a mission every two or three days. Okay. When I've seen some of this of these helicopter pilots in Vietnam flying two, three, four times a day, mm -hmm. that's awful tough to be flying several times a day and the next yeah. day go do the same thing. And so it wasn't wasn't bad for us. Okay. And uh, I might have said earlier to you that uh, the Japanese planes had been shot down or withdrawn by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were replacement pilots in late 44. Yep. So we'd lose some planes from ground fire, but our losses were relatively low. Okay. And uh, our missions were all go in and strafe and drop our bombs mm -hmm. from low level on whatever the target was. And uh, I, I just wanted to comment on the, how different it was from the flying that the bombers made out of England mm. into Europe where they're flying up at altitude and so they can't put enough clothes on to keep <laughs> warm and up there for eight hours and wearing oxygen masks. And what we're doing down in the Philippines, we're wearing a khaki shirt and khaki pants as our uniform. <laughs> And we didn't even carry oxygen, so we didn't even have to use an oxygen mask. So the comfort of the missions was couldn't be more different. I, I'm guessing very humid as well. Yes, yeah. yes, humid there. Yes. So what what did the what did a typical mission look like? How long did it take? What would you be attacking? Okay, they'd vary from two hours to six hours. Okay. We, we had a couple of six-hour missions, mm -hmm. which would mean three hours out and three hours back. That's a long time to sit in one position in the cockpit, and you're not you're not going any place. And uh, <laughs> there might be a relief tube that you could use to relieve yourself. Um, but you got to pay it. You got to be flying the airplane in mm -hmm. formation and watching your engine instruments and, and watching your navigation mm -hmm. to and from the mission. So uh, these these missions are tough. Now you had these fighter planes f flying out of England in World War II on. I think eight, nine hours mission. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's t terribly tough. Yeah. But anyway, our missions varied. Um, one of the missions, we were the first low-level flight against Corregidor. Now, Corregidor oh, right. is an island in, in Manila Bay mm -hmm. that was the last place that um, the MacArthur and the Allies were pushed out of mm -hmm. in 1942, and it had big guns, so it was a barrier to, to uh, uh, vessels wanting to go in or out of Manila Bay. And the Japanese had a lot of people there. And there, there were a lot of underground tunnels, which had been there from when the Allies were there. So they'd been dropping bombs on Corregidor, but everybody was underground anyway. Mm -hmm. We were on the first, first low-level attack. So we'd come up and circled around Mont Bataan, just north of there, and turn around to the south to come in on Corregidor, and we thought we'd catch them by surprise. We'd spread out into a, uh, I can't think of the name, but when we're spread out in a straight line of mm -hmm. 10, 
ten planes and uh, come over Corregidor. Well, it turns out we didn't surprise them. There was ground fire. Uh, and I happened to be on the right-hand side and our, my peripheral vision, I saw the muzzle fire of a machine gun. So I turned over towards that, and I'm just we're just off the ground. And so I could fire some from our 650 calibers, but didn't have a chance to fire much. But I could drop about three bombs mm -hmm. right on my, the, they were firing that machine gun from the mouth of a cave. And uh, I could drop uh, probably three or four bombs right on that. Mm -hmm. We, when you're flying at low level, you can't, the bombs you drop can't be instantaneous mm -hmm. or they'll blow up your airplane. Yep. So we had a three or five second delayed fuses on the gun, so I could drop that and they should have skipped right into that cave. Uh, then we, and so then I turned to go back and join the others and we're flying over Manila Bay by this time. Mm -hmm. There were some water gushers coming up the uh, Japanese from both Corregidor and Fort, nearby Fort Drum uh, were apparently shooting some artillery shells over there and they'd explode on contact and send up a water gusher. When you're flying at 240 miles an hour and you hit one of those water gushers, they say it'll pull your wing off. Ooh. So we... <laughs> We avoided the water gushers and crossed our fingers. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the most dramatic mm -hmm. mission I was on. Before I did, just joined, to say, did you did you stay at low level all the way across the bay, or did you climb out at, at any point? We stayed at low level for mm -hmm. a ways, and mm -hmm. then events got away from there a ways, and then climbed climbed mm -hmm. back up. But the the gunner in a, a a plane next to us told the gunner, my gunner, I was flying so low I was leaving a what do you call it behind us? Awake. Huh? Awake? Awake. Yeah. I was leaving a wake behind us. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah. Uh a lot of the missions were in close ground support mm -hmm. of the armed forces. Uh, where the Japanese were lined up uh, in, mm -hmm. in uh, tr tunnels, trenches and so forth, and right near our forces, and we'd come over and have to use care mm -hmm. to be sure we're not dropping on our own forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, others would be a village in the Philippines where they, it's reported that the Japanese had a truck and a few men. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go over in single ship formations against those. It was tough on the village. We hope, you'd have to hope that the... Uh, well, Filipinos had been warned and left the village, mm -hmm. I don't know. But then frequently after that, we'd see uh, flames go up that were from oil, looked like probably the fuel from the truck. Mm -hmm. So we think there really was something there. Mm -hmm. one, one question for you is navigation. Because the Philippines look a lot the same no matter where you're flying. How, how do you navigate to a specific target? Are you being called in by radio or are you just following the map on your, on your leg? It's following the map, mm -hmm. but the Philippines are, it, it, it's a lot of islands. Mm -hmm. And so, lose, well, Mindanao is the biggest one, but mm -hmm. that's down near the equator. Mm -hmm. 
and that was some activity there, but not much. The main one was Luzon. Yep. And uh, but the the islands are different enough shape, and even though, uh, I, well, I think in Luzon, even internally, mm -hmm. you've got enough geographic differences okay uh, that it's easy to navigate as long as you got good weather mm -hmm. and uh, then there's enough in Luzon especially there's enough villages mm -hmm. in some cities okay that the navigation isn't is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Or not, not much of a problem. Because yeah. you've got, your workload is very high, isn't it? You're navigating, aviating, yeah. bombardier, gunner. Gunner. You, you've got yeah. a lot going on in the cockpit. Yeah, yeah. but also the engine, you've got to keep track of your engine instruments. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you have temperatures start to go up on an engine, mm -hmm. you better be aware of it and figure out what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're right, and you're flying formation. That's the most difficult part. Yep. The navigation, you... You, 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 st you stay with your friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But to fly formation takes 100% of your time. Stress, stressful keeping it in the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Flying close formation is not easy. I mean, it's, it's okay. <laughs> But it takes constant attention. Yeah. So are you are you looking at a certain point on an aircraft to keep yourself in, or are you just looking at a shape? How how do the you wing, keep the yeah. wing? The wing reference right. to the wing. Mm -hmm. uh, and our typical formation would be a three ship formation mm -hmm. with the lead ship and then two one on each side flying just behind and just above mm -hmm. the lead ship. Mm -hmm. And then if there, there might be nine or 12 ships in total, but if so, it's still in uh, groups of three. Mm -hmm. So like, like, like the picture you took here? Yes, yeah. yes. And... Uh, v very tight, because you can, you can even see the exhausts glowing <laughs> over, over on that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The call, what they call the calls, the A twenties that flew in Africa, and in uh, and in Europe, they flew mostly at medium altitude, five mm -hmm. to ten thousand feet. Yeah, and so they they flew with a pilot. The crew was a pilot and two gunners, mm -hmm. one in the turret on the top of the plane behind the bomb bay and the other one an open hatch at the bottom of the airplane. In the Pacific we were flying all low level mm -hmm. so the there's the there's nothing the second gunner can do with that open hatch on the bottom mm -hmm. so we always flew with just one gunner. Okay. But it's interesting, we went, two of them were assigned to us, trained and went overseas with us, but we never flew that way. So I, I guess that made it <clears throat> frustrating for them to get their, their mission count up. That's it, mm -hmm. it's in, almost impossible for them mm -hmm. to get their missions in. So uh, a lot of them left. I don't know where they went, but they transferred out. I think some of them transferred out to the ground crews. Okay. But I think some of them transferred someplace else within the Army, and I just, I just don't know okay. what happened on that. So how, how many missions did you fly? I uh, flew 52 missions, two missions in New Guinea, mm -hmm. and then the other 50 missions in the Philippines. And uh, see, I got to the Philippines in December of 44. So mm -hmm. between then and June, June, maybe early July of 45, I got 50 missions in. Mm -hmm. 
and one leaf. Well, the, the missions were interesting. I didn't mind the missions at all, but the, it was interesting in this, you know, this difference between two or three hours and six hour yeah. missions. So was there a lot of coordination with the army on the ground? Because you uh, MacArthur pushing north and- There was some. Yeah. How much, I don't know, because I think it's just the, the person leading the mission mm -hmm. is the one that had the radios that could right. communicate okay. yeah. with the ground forces. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think there was, but I think it was just at the site. Mm -hmm. And I, and this is of close support to the Army. This was er early on, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I'm sure it got more better coordinated later. Yep. But, and, and you see at that time, the uh, radio technology wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. And so it was really limited and and lots of times the radio communication didn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there was no alternative ground communication. Mm -hmm. So it was a relatively elemental as far as the radio communication technology mm -hmm. as well as the techniques that could be used. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to go out and see the aircraft in a minute. Okay. But I wanted to ask what was it like coming home? Because you'd been been in the Pacific for the best part of a year. When when did you get back? Uh, in early August of forty five. Oh, so so if you finished, if you got your fifty two in June, you were home back to the states relatively quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we went on a ship. Load us, loaded us up in Manila and bypassed Hawaii, pulled into south of San Diego, stayed overnight at March Field, which I thought, gee, this is the nicest climate I've ever been in. <laughs> But I, I was just I was just interested about the, that sort of journey home. That on the way out you had some nice stops, Hawaii yeah. and places like that. But on the way back they just took you straight to the states. Yeah, we had a a, a twenty one day ocean cruise. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't bad. There was a lot of, you know, they had the ship loaded with people, but still good. Good food and everybody happy about going home. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's right. <laughs> so, but yeah, we were we were traveling in roughly the same waters and about the same time that the cruiser Indianapolis was uh. hit by a Japanese submarine mm -hmm. and. And those men had been, some of them, well, the ones that survived were in the water for three or four days. Yeah. Terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they lost track of that. People weren't following up on that cruiser. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. But the whole, and, uh, oh, we, we, uh, on the ship we were traveling on, they made this zigzag. Mm -hmm. They changed their heading every 12 or yeah. 15 minutes or whatever yep. it is. I was taking a nap up on deck one day and all of a sudden the boat made a sharper, sharper than usual turn. Mm -hmm. And I sat up and wondered what it was. There was a whale up ahead that the <laughs> ship avoided. 
turn turn more sharply to avoid the whale. So <laughs> thought, that's a good thing. Yeah. But every, I did uh, see a whale when we were flying off the Philippines one time and saw this whale down in the water, but of course there was only a we could see him very well. He was only a couple feet of water above him. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess all that time in sunnier climes, you were quite happy to, to come back to the southwest when you retired. Yeah, that's true, although really Southern Cal San Diego would have been the desirable <laughs> place. But San Diego, it's, too, it's so nice that San Diego is too popular. Yes. Most, most of us can't afford San Diego. <laughs> and it's, it's crowded too. Mm. Yeah. But uh, no, we were in living in Denver mm -hmm. area. I was had worked there and then retired, and uh, we visited here, and just a week here and a week in Phoenix, visit friends. But my wife had. Uh, like to walk and mm -hmm. in Denver once in a while you got cold enough to have icy sidewalks or and she'd fallen a time or two so after we were here about five days she said I wonder if we might not move here <laughs> to Green Valley and we did and then after we'd been here a while I volunteered work here at the Pima Air Museum, and they just have so many airplanes here that are so interesting. <clears throat> My wife calls it overwhelming. Yeah. yeah there's just yeah. so many aircraft. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's right. Why don't we grab Andy and go out and see your old plane? Okay. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A20G Havoc. And the A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier. Um, in the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. Um, this aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission, uh, I think bombing Miwak. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s and in the early 90s it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had they restored the one Helen Pelican, which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. Um, they used a lot of the parts from this aircraft with that aircraft. Then actually went to a civilian owner, and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration and put it on display here. I have to say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft, I think just because of the you know, lack of them as survivors and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports and you know they are like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships um, so just always found it to be To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have please visit www.pimaair.org I think you're gonna. I think you're gonna have to go up here. Because if there's a release, it's probably it's back right, there. It's that one right there. Yeah. All right, we'll go up. We'll take a look, and then you know, bring it back down. We got it. Yep. Yeah, the reason why is because I don't know if I could be up there unless I'm attached to a harness system. I know you guys won't do that back in the day, but. 
Yeah, it seems like that'd be wrong. I've never seen, see, take a look at what this is. Uh -huh. See this? Yeah. Hole through glass. This thing right back there. Yeah, yeah. Is that bulletproof glass? What? Bulletproof glass. Well, I probably. But that have to that would have have to have been done in Australia. Because it's not factory, and I never saw an A20 with that in it. Yeah. So it must have been early on. Like, okay. Oh, you want my hand first? Yeah, get your foot over, and whenever you're ready for your hand to I think maneuver, help. however you want to do it. Yeah, I'll take your hand in just a minute. Keep on, keep on here. Yeah. Okay, there you go. There you go. Go ahead and put a lot of pressure on yours. There you go, you're good. Perfect. Okay. Right. How many years has it been, Bob? Eighty. <laughs> eighty-five. No, not eighty-five. Eighty. Oh. Are those working? Doesn't look like it. Are they working? The so. No, they're not working, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a word with Andy later about that. <laughs> no, the, the, control the control cables aren't connected. <laughs> okay, we're clear to go on. The rest of the way in the car. How are you feeling, Bob? Fine. Good. Yeah. So, talk us around the cockpit, because we looked at the picture earlier. What's... You, it's, you need to be back here. I need to be back there. Okay, well, Jefferson can come pick me up then. Can right. you get him back yeah. here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Right, Bob. You're back in your aircraft. Let's talk through it a bit. Yeah. See, I, I need to be down farther. I'm just... Are you going to try to sit down? Yeah. yeah. You want a hand? Okay. There you go. Push your right leg on out of there. And maybe right. <sighs> You're stuck on the lip there, Bob. My legs are too cramped. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. Help me up a there little. Not, not too much. Just, just a minute. There we go. There we go. Okay. 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 Try it again. Yeah. Okay. Down. 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 Ready. One, no, no, down. Down. Okay. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Now you're in the seat. Yeah. How's she feel? Wow. Out of the picture. We sort of got a bird's eye view from up here. How does it feel? I'm fine. <laughs> Do you want to talk us through the controls? Tell us how you'd fly her. Just like this. <laughs> yeah. Just like this. So, 
radio button over there? I don't know what that is. <laughs> this is a, there is a trigger here. Yep. And there was a bomb release. Bomb release here. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll tell Andy that he's not got all his buttons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but the, so, mixture or red? Yeah. Is that right? I think, so, yeah. yeah. And then. Yeah, mixture. Oh, this is a prop control, okay. RPM. This is throttle, RPM. Yep. Mixture. Okay. And, and here you can tighten these up. Oops. This is probably the Bombay. I don't know what <laughs> it is. So would you fly with these? Would you fly with your panels open for a bit of air? Well, on the ground you might. Okay. On the ground, but before takeoff you shut those. Okay. On the ground just for air. Mm -hmm. Was it sort of cooler once you were up, or was it sort of hot the whole time? Say again. Was it cooler when you were flying, or was it sort of hot the whole time? No, you get up in the air. Mm -hmm. I guess it's warm, but depends. Hmm. Yeah, okay. But this. Huh. I think that's malt. It's amazing. So I never saw this. You didn't have one? I think it was on the early ones. They must, in Australia, they put this in. OK. So you didn't have the extra bulletproof glass? You didn't have the bulletproof glass, no? No. Uh -uh. Never saw that. See, this is working pretty good. <laughs> so what do you think? You could start her up and take her for a flight now? What? You could start her up and take her for a flight? <laughs> <laughs> huh. You it, got what you want? Um, this is all for you, sir. How do you feel being back in the cockpit? Well, that's great. I wanted to sit in the, well, in the cockpit once again. <laughs> well, it, you look very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, great. Bob is just brilliant. And I think you can tell that it was special for him to get back into that aircraft. And there was lots of bits of the footage I'd cut out, which was just him working his way around the cockpit, feeling things out. And all that credit goes to Andy Bailey for making all this happen. And of course, to Jefferson Fleming, the exhibits technician who joined us, drove the scissor lift and made it all happen on the day. So many thanks to Andy and Jefferson, Scott and the team out at Pima. And for you guys for making this all happen, because if you'd not wanted to wait around a week to see Bob in the havoc, you could have been a damn castier and got it all early. From just £3 a month over on our Patreon page, you get these episodes as soon as I put them all together, plus some extra bits and pieces. You can join our group chats as well. And we get to do as much AV geekery as I can squeeze in, as making this show takes up a lot of time, and sometimes I can forget to do those bits. But you get all this early, and if I'm filming near your way, you're more than welcome to hang out and help out on this because we've got more episodes with damn Castillo joe welding coming up phil blood's even joined us on that so yeah it's all happening but until next time thank you so much for joining us thank you to the fabulous team at the pima air and space museum for making this wonderful time with bob ryerson happen thanks for joining us until next time do take care of yourselves the Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.